I'm a college dropout. I was homeless, lived in a car for three years. I've lost every single thing I had, family included. I've been written off so many times. But today, the person that you sitting in front of you is a process. I want to talk to you for a moment about the process. Because see, one way to get a person to really follow you is to be the example of what you get, of what you're trying to get them to follow. You know, my daddy used to tell me all the time, he said, son, best thing you can do for poor people is not be one of them, because you can't help the cause. Your brain is divided into two halves, positive and negative, good and evil. Each half of your brain has millions of factory workers on each side. You got a million factory workers on the positive side. You got a million factory workers on the negative side. At the forefront of each one of those factories in your brain is a foreman. You got foreman positive and you got foreman negative. You are in charge. You're the boss of the factory. So let me show you how this works. You got a remote control. You go to your house tonight and you press that power button and you press it. When you point it at the TV, what do you expect to happen? You expect TV to come on. You press the power button, you expect the TV to come on. If you want to watch HBO and HBO is channel 300 and you press 300 and then you press select, what do you expect to come on that TV? And what comes on that TV? So now, since your brain is in two halves, let me show you how this works. You wake up in the morning and you say, man, I don't feel myself today. I got up on the wrong side of the bed. I'm not a morning person. Foreman negative. Her hears that. He steps to the front. He said, what did you say? You say, I said I woke up on the wrong side of the bed day. I'm not myself. I'm not a morning person. He says, you got it right away. He said, hey, the boss just woke up and said he's not a morning person. He's having a bad day today, and he ain't feeling himself. Let's get to work. The million factory workers start producing thoughts to justify what you just said. So now guess what? Man, I hate my alarm clock went off this morning. I got to get out here in this traffic. I'm going to drive down here today. I don't even like these people on my job. I can't stand this car I'm finna get in this morning. Sure wish I had a new car, but I'm driving this ragged ass car. And on and on and on. And your day starts tumbling into what you ordered at the top of the day. You can wake up in the morning and you say, you know what? Today is going to be a great day today. I expect something really good to happen for me today. Man, thank you, Lord, for waking me up this morning. He said, what did you say? You said, I said, I'm having a great day today. I expect something good to happen today. Thank you, Lord, for waking me up. Foreman Positive turns around and goes, all right, let me have your attention. Steve's having a great day today. He's expecting some wonderful things to happen. And man, let's get it going. And they start manufacturing thoughts. Same brain. Man, I can't wait to go to work today. It may not be the job I want, but at least I got a job. I appreciate the fact that I don't have a car, but at least I can walk to the train. Man, this is going to be great today. That's how your mind works 24-7. It never turns off. You have got to change the way you think. It is the whole determining factor of where you go in life. We are all where we are today because we thought ourselves to this position. If you don't like the position, think yourself out of it. Change your attitude, you change your altitude. I'm going to tell you something that every successful person has to do, including you. Believe it or not, every successful person in this world has jumped. I'm going to tell you what I mean by that. You eventually, you are going to have to jump. You cannot just exist in this life. You have got to try to live. If you are waking up thinking that it's got to be more to your life than it is, man, believe that it is. Believe in your heart of hearts that it is. But to get to that life, you're going to have to jump. You see people in life, when you're standing on the cliff of life and you see people soaring by, when you see people soaring, going to exotic places, you hear about them doing wonderful things. Maybe you look up the street and your neighbor just gets a car every year, every two years. You know, how is he doing that? Have you ever thought 
Maybe this person right here has identified their gift and is living in their gift because your Bible says, this your Bible says your gift will make room for you. Your gift, not your education. You go get an education, that's nice. But if you don't use your gift, that education only gonna take you so far. Man. I know a lot of people got degrees, man. Dang, they ain't even using them. It's your gift. But the only way for you to soar is you got to jump. You got to take that gift that's packed away on your back. You got to jump off that cliff and pull that cord. That gift opens up and provides the soar. If you don't ever use it, you're going to just go to work. And if you're getting up going to work on a job every day that you hate going to, that ain't living, man. You just existed. At one point in time, you ought to see what living's like. But the only way to see what living like, you got to jump. And here the problem. Let me just be real with you. When you first jump, let me tell you something. Your parachute will not open right away. I, I'm sorry. I, I wish I could tell you it did, but it don't. When you jump, it's not going to open right away. You're going to hit them rocks. You're going to get some skin tore off on them cliffs. You're going to get all your clothes tore off. You're going to get some cuts on you. You're going to be bleeding pretty bad. But eventually, eventually, the parachute has to open. That is a promise of God. Here's another thing. You can play it safe and deal without the cuts and the tears. And you can stand on that cliff of life forever safe. But if you don't jump, I got another promise I can make you. Your parachute will never open. You'll never know. You'll never know what God really has for you. I was speaking at a school once. I was talking to the students. The principal was mortified with my message because I was telling the truth. I was telling the kids, your education is, poor, is important, but your education is not the most important thing in your life. I'm sorry, it's not. Your dream is the most important thing in this world. The principal came up on the stage while I was speaking. Don't ever say that to my school again. Well, I'm just telling you, dog. You can save your kids a lot of pain if you ever talk to them about their dreams. You got to talk to young people about their dreams. If you talk to kids about their dreams, your dreams can spur you to get the education. But if you never find out what a child is dreaming about, you can't hold their attention. It's the dream, man. You got to dream about something so big that it dwarfs all your fears. The way you overcome fear is with your dream. You got to make your dream so big that nothing matters except that dream. You're willing to do everything that's necessary. I was listening to Will Smith the other day. Will Smith said the best things in life is on the other side of fear. It's on the other side of fear. But fear freezes people, man. The fear of failure freezes people. Suppose I don't do it. Well, you might, you might not make it. But I got news for you. If you don't do it, you damn sure ain't gonna make it. Faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. I talk to so many people who get older, like some of us are, and they've lost their faith. Well, faith is really simple. It's the, faith is the substance of things hoped for. All that mean is in the beginning, you just hope something pop off. You know, you just kind of hope something happened for you. I was hoping I would get on TV. I wrote it on a piece of paper when I was 10, I want to be on TV. The problem I had when I wrote it at 10 was I suffered from a severe stuttering problem. I could not talk outside of my house. So can you imagine when I wrote on a piece of paper, I want to be on TV and turn that in. The first thing the little boy next door, next to me asked me, he did, well, how long is your TV show going to be? Because you you're going to be on TV all day. But when I wrote it on the paper, it wasn't factual. I was just hoping. You just got to start with the hope. Faith is the substance of things that you hope for. You just hope something, Joe. Then what happened is through grace and favor, he give you a couple of them things you hope for, and then you're supposed to start believing then. Because now it turns into faith. But if you take this scripture, faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. Albert Einstein said that imagination is everything. It's the preview to life's coming attraction. That's what your imagination is. Your imagination is actually very, very real. Everything you imagine 
could be a preview to life's coming attraction. Everything we have today came from somebody's imagination. Somebody was talking on the phone with that cord on the wall and got sick of it and said, you know what, man, if I could just go outside and talk on the phone, ta-da, we got cell phones. <laughs> Somebody got tired of driving across the country and said, man, if I could fly over there, boom, we got airplanes. Imagination is everything. It's a preview to life's coming attractions. Everything you've ever imagined is real. The problem with most people is you think your imagination is hocus pocus. It's really not. It's a preview of a coming attraction. If you react to your imagination, that's where your real life is. It's just God showing you what he has for you. It's the problem people have is they tell their imagination to the wrong people. See, if you want to kill a big dream, tell it to a small-minded person. It's dead. How many times, man, have you had a tremendous idea? Something you thought was the one, and you went and told it to your loved ones and your so-called friends, and they shot it down. I mean, you was convinced that it was just, oh, man, I just came to you. And you told it to me, and they shot it down. And you thought since they was your loved ones and they friends, and they got your best interests at heart, you believed them. You was wrong. They taught, you let them talk you out of what God got for you. As a kid, you know, I, I didn't know, but my, my gift is that I found out later on, I have the ability to think extremely quick and I can take any piece of information and transpose it into comedy immediately. Now, when you're a kid and you don't understand that, you get in a lot of trouble. I didn't know what it was until I got older, that this was a gift, that, that it, it did make room for me, that I became a stand-up comedian, which started with a dream of mine, and, it led to where I am today. It's a lot of stuff that happened in between there. But your gift is the thing that you do the absolute best with the least amount of effort. That's your God-given gift, and everybody has one, and God gives it to you at birth. You don't have to go anywhere to discover it. It's not in the water, it's not on the mountaintop, it ain't hid under a rock. Your God-given gift is instilled in you at birth. If you pursue that as opposed to your passion, there lies your greatest chance for success. The problem with people is we don't, we don't, we don't pursue our gift oftentimes. We try to go get an education and make it think that's gonna get us somewhere. If you identify that gift, man, that gift is the thing that, that can make you great. We're all participating in this thing called life. Life has ebb and flows. Mountain tops, it's got valleys, it's got it's got thunderstorms in it, earthquakes. This life, it don't you stop expecting it to go smooth because it ain't finna go smooth. The road to success is always under construction. Ain't no, this, is, this life ain't set up to be smooth. You, you combat negativity and you combat uh, discouraging, discouragement with gratitude. It's the one way to combat discouragement is with gratitude. What messes you up is you focus on the thing that's not happening, and that causes you to get discouraged. So whenever you get discouraged, you have to change your focus from what's not happening to what has happened, and it straightens you out immediately. Because what causes the, the, the downslide is if you get wrapped up into what ain't happening, it get ugly, man, and it just snowballs. But you have to focus on gratitude. People don't understand how serious gratitude is. You know, it's, it's a serious principle of success. It's hard to be miserable and grateful at the same time. You have to take chances in life. If you don't take chances in life, you'll never have the life God has for you. Life is about risk. If you play it safe in life, you ain't gonna have much of a life. If you play it safe, you won't have much of a life. Life is risk. It take, it take courage to pursue your dream. I just did it. It cost me everything, but eventually, God is very good, man, when he sees you take a leap of faith. He supplies you everything you need. Now, it's gonna cost you something, but most people, most people, most people are not willing to pay what it costs to go after your dream, because you're gonna have to hurt a little bit. And most people don't like being uncomfortable. If you don't wanna be uncomfortable, please do not pursue success, because success is a very uncomfortable feeling. And I just learned to be, I learned to be comfortable being uncomfortable. See, if you think you're too old to make it, let me give you a prime example. Colonel Sanders. Colonel Sanders has been frying chicken his whole life. 
He was telling everybody he had the best chicken in the world. Ain't nobody believe him. They turned him down everywhere. Colonel Sanders didn't get a franchise till he was in his 60s. Kentucky Fried Chicken sell more chicken than anybody in the world today. So if you're sitting there thinking because you got a little gray on you, you're too late. As long as God waking you up in the morning, that's the sign that he ain't through with you. So what you tripping for? Last year I spoke at the SALT Convention. The SALT Convention is where billionaires from around the world gather. They gather in Vegas once a year to talk about how they're going to change the world. There's a couple hundred billionaires in this world. They all come to Las Vegas once a year to SALT Convention. I was asked last year to be the keynote speaker. And I'm tripping because I'm not a billionaire. And I asked a guy who asked me to do it, I said, I'm, I'm not a billionaire, you do understand that. We said, Mr. Harvey, we know, we know everything about you. We know your net worth and everything. I said, well, what can you all learn from me? He said, everything. He said, the reason we want to hear your story is because the majority of us that are billionaires, we inherited some money and we grew it. A couple of us in, inherited a billion, we automatically, some of us in, inherited 300 million and we turn it into a billion. You come from nothing. What we want to know is how you got to where you are after coming from nothing. How did you live in a car for three years and wind up on more TV shows than anybody? How did you survive flunking out of school? How did you survive all of that? We want to know that because in case something happens to us, we don't really have the information that you have on how to come from the back to the front or how to come from the bottom to the top. So I get asked oftentimes to speak. And so when I was telling them how I made it, I was telling them about the fortitude that I developed. And then I told them about the faith that I had. And that was really startling to them. Now, a lot of them are people of faith, but a lot of people who were born with a lot of money ain't really had to have a lot of faith. You understand? You have an idea of what it feels like. You've seen some kids get put in foster care. You've seen child protective services come to somebody's house. You've seen kids come to school with less. You might have been one of the kids that went to school with less. You have struggled to give your kids a better life than the one you had. They, they don't hear this. But I'm going to tell you something right now. You can be successful without an education. You can be successful without coming from a rich family. You can be successful. I don't care what color you are, what faith you belong to, your sexual preference. I don't care what's wrong with you. You can be successful. Everybody in your life will have a turn back moment. No matter who you are, you're going to have such a period in your life where it seems like it's not working. You're going to have doubts. You're going to have a lot of trials and tribulations and challenges. And everybody has what's called a turn back moment. You always have a moment in your life where the direction you're going, you will have to make a decision to keep going or you turn back. The sad thing is the average person turns back. But think about this. If you're going somewhere and you turn back, you can never get there. If you wake up every day and go get in your car and say, I'm going to the store, and halfway to the store, you turn around, and then the next day, you go to the store and you turn around, you do realize that you will never get to the store. So whatever you needed from the store now is even a greater need because you turn back. And every time you turn back, it does not change the need. So what kept me from going was, what kept me going was, I, re I created, I made turning back, giving up never an option. And I had really dark moments, man, where I thought I was going. I just didn't think I was going to make it. I, I mean, where I am today, I didn't see it clearly at all. I had a lot of turn back moments. But you know what it was for me, man? Being successful is so hard, but I realized that not being successful was hard too. The difference between not being successful hard and trying to get successful and hard, if you're trying to get successful and it's hard, at least there's some payout. There's a payoff. If you hang in there, there's payoff. 
when you're not successful, it's hard. It's hard not having money. It's hard never knowing how to come up with your mortgage and your and your bond and your rent. It's, it's hard not knowing that. Why, how you gonna feed your children? How you gonna pay your bills? It's hard, ain't it? So if it's hard that way, and it's hard being successful, I might as well deal with how hard it is to be successful, because at least one day, that could be a payout. If, if you just stay in the hard part of life of not being successful, ain't no payoff. I have to say this first. No matter what you hear me say, no matter how I tell my story, no matter what piece of information I lay out in front of you, please tag that with cause of God. My life is favor. You know, Bishop Jakes told me one time, when you got favor on your life, no matter what you thrown into, you're gonna always rise to the top. I have been thrown into a lot, but because of favor and grace, I just keep, I just keep showing up somehow, man, no matter what they do. And so all of this that I have is really because of the grace of God. Now, I'm gonna tell you something. You gotta have a tremendous work ethic to be successful in here. In other words, and you can relate to this, you gotta have a lot of dog in you. <laughs> you really do, man, if you wanna be successful, because it's, it's gonna be a lot of trying times. So you have to have a tremendous work ethic. But you got to have faith. Faith without works is dead. Albert Einstein said once, he said, imagination is everything. It's the preview to life's coming attractions. Everything you have, everything we have in this world, somebody imagined it. It's your ima imagination is tremendous. Somebody was sitting on the phone one day talking with a cord to the wall and said, man, I wish I could just go outside with this phone. Everybody in here got a cell phone. Somebody imagined that. Somebody got tired of riding in a wagon cross country from slavery to freedom. Somebody said, I wish we had something that made these wheels move by themselves. We drive cars. People got tired of driving from New York to LA. Somebody said, I wish we could fly. We got airplanes. Imagination is everything. It's the preview to life's coming attractions. Your real life, the one God really got for you, is in your imagination. It is not in your current situation or your current paycheck. And if you've been living like that, you have then restricted yourself to a commonality that is really not yours. Because what really God got for you is really in your imagination. Faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. So when I told you a minute ago, you gotta have a tremendous work ethic, but you gotta have a lot of faith. I talk to so many people who get older, like some of us are, and they've lost their faith. Well, faith is really simple. It's the, faith is the substance of things hoped for. All that means is in the beginning, you just hope something pop up. You know, you just kind of hope something happened for you. I was hoping I would get on TV. I wrote it on a piece of paper when I was 10. I want to be on TV. The problem I had when I wrote it at 10 was I suffered from a severe stuttering problem. I could not talk outside of my house. So can you imagine when I wrote on a piece of paper, I want to be on TV and turn that in. But when I wrote it on the paper, it wasn't factual. It was just hope. You just got to start with the hope. Faith is the substance of things that you hope for. You just hope something, Joe. Then what happened is through grace and favor, he give you a couple of them things you hope for, and then you're supposed to start believing then. Because now it turns into faith. But if you take this scripture, faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. What is the evidence of things not seen? I just told it to you. Albert Einstein said, imagination is everything. It's the preview to life's coming attraction. But guess what? Your imagination really is. It's the evidence of things not seen. Because your imagination, you know why it's the evidence of things not seen? Because you're the only one who can see it. Your imagination 
is actually God showing you a preview of a coming attraction that he has for you. The moment you don't believe in your imagination, you negate what he got for you. Your imagination is the preview to life's coming attraction. It is the evidence of things not seen. Because can't nobody see it with you. Your problem is you keep telling your imagination to the wrong people. See, if you want to kill a big dream, tell it to a small-minded person. It's dead. How many times, man, have you had a tremendous idea? Something you thought was the one, and you went and told it to your loved ones and your so-called friends, and they shot it down. I mean, you was convinced that it was just, oh, man, I just came to you. And you told it to them and they shot it down. And you thought since they was your loved ones and they friends and they got your best interests at heart, you believed them. You was wrong. They taught, You let them talk you out of what God got for you. Some of y'all still sitting here with the ambition of opening a business one day, but you scared to go start the business because you got a job and you got bills. Rich people got bills. Everybody got bills. Hell, I got bills. You, you, who, you, everybody owes somebody something. I got something with the bank right now. You're going to let the fact that you got some bills stop you from opening the business, the thing that God didn't put in your imagination, so you're going to squash that because you got bills. Everybody got bills. Your real life is in your imagination. Can, can, you, can, you, can you grab what I'm telling you? So I don't know what you thought I was going to say to you. I'm just a real dude. I don't even have the education you all have. I flunked out of school. I flunked. I ain't got no education. I don't use four-syllable words. What I'm sharing with you is stuff that everybody can apply today. If you are sitting in here thinking that you're too old to listen to what Steve... Hell, I'm 60. But I still rely on my imagination. See, if you think you're too old to make it, let me give you a prime example. Colonel Sanders. Colonel Sanders has been frying chicken his whole life. He was telling everybody he had the best chicken in the world. Ain't nobody believe him. They turned him down everywhere. Colonel Sanders didn't get a franchise till he was in his 60s. Kentucky Fried Chicken sell more chicken than anybody in the world today. So if you're sitting there thinking because you got a little gray on you, you're too late, as long as God waking you up in the morning, that's the sign that he ain't through with you. So what you tripping for? You sitting up in here like, like God can't do nothing for you because you 60. Man, you know what I'm asking God for right now? And I'm 60. If you could see my vision board, you would be, you would be blown away. Because I got enough right now. I really know. But I ain't in the need business. I'm in the want business. Ain't nothing wrong with wanting something. Quit going down to these churches y'all sitting up in here going down to, let, keeping you in these little boxes. God got a big life for you. The smallest scripture I ever read changed my life. The scripture is real simple. You have not because you ask not. Do you know the difference that that could make in your life? I'm just giving you real talk now. I'm just trying to tell you how I got here. See, I, I have no education. See, you have not because you asked not. When the last time you really asked him for something? Or do you keep making requests that's inside the confines of your paycheck? When you gonna get outside of that? Didn't I just tell you God ain't in your paycheck? Didn't I just tell you he ain't in your job title? The life God got for you is in your imagination. Why you still imagine this stuff? Why you keep dreaming of a summer home? Why you keep dreaming of retirement, leaving your grandkids money? So I'm at the age now where I think about my grandkids. I got seven TV shows. Dog, I only need one. One show pay me enough money. I just need one. I do not live my life in the confines of what anybody says to me. I let my imagination go 
and now imagination is a preview to life's coming attraction. But what that really means is, is God showing you a preview of what he has for you. So now, if you have not because you ask not, do you understand if you up your ask, he has to up his give? Just period. This is simple stuff that anybody can apply. You ain't even got to have no degree to do this. You don't even have to have no money to do this. You can start this today and change your whole game because you're going to need grace and favor anyway. You up your ask, he up his give. You have not because you ask not. This ain't a magic trick, man. I get tired of rich people talking to people and they make you buy these programs and stuff so they can drag you out for eight years. You can get the program. I have asked God for some tremendous stuff. Everything he hasn't given to me is on the way. I have no doubt about it. Why would he not? When I was homeless, I lived in a car for three years. I made some decisions in my life, man, and threw myself off a cliff. My decision in October, uh, October 8th, 1985, I walked into a comedy club for the first time on a dare from a girl. I walked into a comedy club for the first time. Had never heard of a comedy club. But all my life, I wanted to be on TV had never heard of a comedy club. October the 8th, I walked into Hilarity's Comedy Club in Cuyahoga Falls, Ohio. It's right outside Africa. I signed up for the following week because I just wanted to see what the comedians did. Man, I wanted, I saw stand, live stand-up for the first time. They had 10 acts supposed to go up, nine of them went up. The 10th guy got scared and went and ran out the door. So I had signed up for the following week. The guy says, Listen, we lost our 10th act. We're going to go to the phones. We're going to go to the week from next week. If Steve Harvey's here, come on up now. So I ran up on stage. I'm doing, I don't even know what to do, but I just started talking about boxing and stuff that happened to me. Audience was hollering, laughing. They brought all 10 of us back up on stage. They had a clap off. I won the clap off. I won $50. I cried from Cuyahoga Falls to Cleveland. The girl kept saying, why are you crying? It ain't but $50. I said, no, you don't understand. This way more than 50. This is what I do. She said, what you mean this is what you do? This is just your first time. Uh, you don't understand. Something happened to me. I won amateur night. I went to work the next day, October 9th, 1985, and quit my job. Now, I don't recommend that you do it that way. Because two years later, I was homeless. Because <laughs> the first year of comedy, I made $3,400. The next year, I made $4,800. And the third year, I made $5,300. I got a wife, a set of twins. I'm sending every dollar I got to them. So I tried to live on $50, $75 a week. Gas was $0.38 cent a gallon back then. I just stayed in my car. So I lived in my car for three years. Three years I lived in my car. And what happened was, I just said, man, so I used to fish all the time to eat because I'm a fisherman, I'm a bass fisherman. So I used to stop at lakes and ponds and just fish. And every night, every month, I get run off from somebody's land. Hey, get away from here. Hey, move along, that's not yours. Hey, stop fishing here, I just get run off. And he didn't understand. And one time I had fish on the line. They said, you got fish on that line? I said, yeah, throw them back. I had to throw them back because I used to stop at rest areas with them little cast iron grills. I kept charcoal in my car. I started frying. I eat fish. There's some days I wouldn't eat. So that, they thought I was just fishing, but I was eating. So I said one day, I said, man, you know what? One day, man, I'm going to give myself some land. I'm going to buy myself a piece of dirt. So fast forward, God bless me. I get on TV when I'm 38. I'm on Showtime at the Apollo. Lord, have mercy. They gave me my money. I saved my money up. I saved $250,000. I said, I'm going to give me some land. I went to Texas. 
and I'm about to buy some land. But before I went to buy the land, I was curious. I just had the thought. I said, man, I wonder how much land is on earth? How, how many acres is on earth? Because you know it's not going to change. You know, God lets you fly. God lets you dive on the water. God don't let you make dirt. Can't make dirt. So I looked it up. It's roughly over, just a little bit over, 36 billion acres of land. 36 billion acres of land. So I just got a little bit more curious, and I said, well, how many people on earth? I looked it up, and it was about 6 billion people on earth. So I did some Steve Harvey thinking. I said, okay, if it's 36 billion acres of land and it's about 6 billion people on earth, everybody ought to have 6 acres of land. I just mean, you know, I just, just think. So I asked God, could I have 6 acres? That's all I wanted. Because you know the one thing I wanted? I didn't care if I put a house on it or nothing. I just wanted to be a stand somewhere and couldn't nobody run me off. Got this money, man. I saved my money. I saved $250,000. I'm going and I'm looking for some land. The first day I get there, I see a piece of land in Texas. So beautiful. I couldn't believe it. It had rolling hills. had a pond on it where I could fish. I, the dude took me over there. I look at the land. And I'm, and I'm looking. And I said, man, this is great right here. I said, sir, how much is this right here? He said, well, it's about $600,000. I said, man, I ain't, I ain't got that kind of money. He said, well, how much do you have? I said, I got 250000 I said, well, let me think about it, man. He said, let me think about it. And I was standing there, and then I stopped. I said, sir, can I ask you a question, man? How many acres of land is that? He said, this is six acres. Six, six years ago, I just asked God, just give me six. See, I didn't want a whole lot of acres. I just wanted my cut. Just give me my six. And so I said, ain't this crazy? So I thought about it. I said, man, what can we work out? Right before I got ready to say it, the guy that took me over there said, Steve, let me show you something right quick. He took me over this hillbilly's house. Took me over to this hillbilly house named Jerry Campbell. I was a little nervous about meeting him, man, because I didn't like the way he talked, but mess around turned out to be one of the finest men I ever met in my life. He became a father figure to me. It's an old white man. He took me to his house. He said, let me show you something. He took me over and showed me this land, and it was massive. It had three lakes on it. It had rolling hills. It had trees. It was unbelievable, man. I said, man, this is incredible. I said, man, how much is this? He said, this 16 acres. I said, hey, man, I ain't got that kind of money. Let me go on back over here to this dude where I can, Mike can cut a deal. He said, well, let me ask you something. What was you going to give that man over there? I said, well, I hadn't worked it out yet because all I got is $250,000. He said, well, listen, I'm in a little bit of a tie right now. Said, if you can bring me 250,000 cash by tomorrow, I'll give you this 16 acres. Next thing you know, I had 270 acres of land. Now, let me tell you something. I'm so busy now, I don't even get to go to that ranch. I never can go. And I thought I was going to be fishing and save it for my kids the rest of life. But God had another plan for me. That's the ranch that I have my mentoring camp on. I bring a thousand black boys out there with a thousand single mothers. And that was the purpose of that ranch. I never go there to fish at all. But see, that's what I wanted. I thought that's what it was for. But God got another plan. His way is way bigger than yours. You can't even see his way. But you got to start to hustle. You got to give God something to work with. Look, if you start hustling and grinding, he'll fill it up for you. 
But if you ain't got no hustle and no grind, he can't fill it up. So guess what? I don't ever go there to use that land for fishing or not. But I'm changing boys' lives over there. My story is really a story about faith. Really is, man. I come out the dirt. I have no college degree. All of my children do. I got seven kids. I sent their last one of them to college. I made sure all my kids went to college because I know they got to have that education. Well, Daddy, you didn't go to college. Well, your ass ain't got no jokes. It's been important for me to empower my children, but not only my children, but thousands of young people across the country. And education is the key for a lot of people. But when I speak at colleges and stuff, I tell people, the number one thing in your world is not your education. It's your dream. So what you dreaming about, y'all? What you still dreaming about? What is God still showing you in your imagination? What are you so afraid of? Why would you not take that leap and go for it before you mess around and die? Why would you not go and see what God really got for you before you leave this world? Why would you hang on to a job? If you live in paycheck to paycheck right now, when you retire, they're going to give you one third of what you can't live on now. They're going to give you a gold watch and a turkey and they're gonna set you on out to pasture. If I was you, before I leave this world, I'd go see what God really got for me. Just take a chance. Now here's why you should take the chance. Name me one time God has not pulled you through. Just name it. Name the one thing God has never pulled you through. If he ain't pulled you through it, he's currently pulling you through it right now. And the reason I know I'm telling the truth is cause you sitting in here. If God was through with you, he wouldn't wake you up no more. When he wakes you up, it's because he ain't through with you yet. He got something else for you. So why don't you go see what that is? Why we got to live our lives like we owe them something? Man, you owe yourself something. Go be free. Go see what God got for you. Oh, Steve, that's easy for you to say you rich. Hell, did you hear me? I lived in a car for three years. I took On October 8th, I won $50. October 9th, I quit. How big a jump you want to take? You ain't even got to do that. A lot of y'all got savings. You may not have three years up, but you only need a little bit. Just jump. Go see what God got for you. Quit sitting here in your life posturing like it's okay. Quit funking the fake. Quit faking the funk. Quit, quit, quit got people thinking you something you ain't, man, when you really know you won't be something else. You ain't got to believe me, but you can look at me. I'm telling you, there's proof in this here now. That the God you serve really will give you what you ask for. He will. I'm not your preacher. I'm a hood dude that the messed around with no education, the messed around got to the top of the TV world, balling out of control. And I'm telling you, I was homeless and lived in a car. And I ain't got no education. Now y'all in here got degrees. I see it on your forehead. I see it on you. I feel when I'm around educated people. I know you know how to study it and math. I, I can look at you, and I'm so proud of you. But hey, man, the next level. The man without a dream or vision shall perish. It never mentions if you don't have an education. Don't forget to pray, but don't be ashamed to pray. Prayer changes things. I don't care how dark it looked for you. I don't care what, what they done said to you. I don't care what the verdict is. I don't care what the haters say. Prayer changed things. I'm talking to a girl that I grew up on a block, man, that it didn't breed success. A lot of people on our block ain't here no more, man. I grew up in a place, man, that was, that was you had to be something else you come up out of there. 
Prayer changes things. I was told I would never be nothing. Prayer changes things. I flunked out of school. Prayer changes things. I'm on my third marriage, lost everything I've owned twice. I've been homeless and lived in a car for three years. Prayer changes things. The cool thing about prayer is the one thing that's available to everybody at any given time. Do you know that God ain't ever too, he ain't ever too busy for you? You know that God actually knows who you are? Do you know that God actually created you to converse with him? Do you know that God would actually love to hear from you? Do you know that I like talking to him even when I don't really need nothing? Quit playing with this here. You're not going to make it without God. If you've tried it so far, tell me how that's working out for you. It suck, don't it? You need God. Don't, don't you think I got here without him. I've needed him every step of the way. If it wasn't for God, I wouldn't even be standing here today. Quit being ashamed about it and worrying about who looking. Go somewhere by yourself today and tell God you need some help. Tell him that you're just tired of trying to figure it out for yourself. You can't be tripping with my walk with him because my path ain't been like yours. This is my version of being saved. All you got to do is get your own version. You ain't got to change. God work with you. God take anybody that want to be saved and he saved. So just like old people used to say, I'm just a nobody trying to tell everybody about somebody that can save anybody. Two things, my dream and my faith. Faith is the belief in things that you cannot see. You can never lose faith. That's the key. You have to believe in something that you can't see. You have to believe when you can't, when you don't see no way how. You have to buckle down and keep believing. God is always coming. Here's the deal. The moment you ask God for something, he boxes it up and he ships it to you. Here's the problem with the package. He never gives you the date that it's going to arrive. It's going to come. He just don't tell you when. If he told you when, it would destroy the relationship that's required to have an abundant life, which is faith. If God told you, you were going to be rich in August of 2021. Do you know how crazy you would talk to people from now until then? Because you know, on August 21, I'm going to be rich. But he don't tell you when the package is going to arrive. So here's the deal. He wants you to stay in faith to receive the package because he only delivers to Faith Street. If you step off over here to I Don't See How Boulevard, he don't ship there. If you get over here to I don't see how circle, he does not ship there. He only sends the boxes to Faith Street. So when he sends it and you'd have moved off Faith Street, the package gotta go back. It's just like UPS or the post office. If they send you a box and you ain't home, they take it back. That's how it works, man. Let me tell y'all something. Being successful is not a magic trick. You just have to learn the principles of success. I ain't got no degree. I got nothing like that to tell you about. I didn't finish school. I flunked out of school. I'm on my third marriage. Lost everything I've owned twice. Been homeless, lived in the car. I am telling you, your education ain't got nothing to do with it. No, man, it's your dreams and visions. A man without a dream or vision shall perish. It's what God puts in your imagination for you to have. Everything God wants you to have, he puts it in your imagination. Albert Einstein said imagination is everything. It's the preview to life's coming attractions. 
everything you imagine is God showing you a preview of a coming attraction he has for you. And he puts it in your imagination so you can see what he got for you. So if you've been imagining that you're going to be rich one day, it's because God wants you to be rich. Now, when you going to ask him for it and are you going to wait for it to happen? Or are you going to lose faith? Here what Christians mess up at. Well, I guess it wasn't the Lord's will. Who are you? How do you know what God's will is? It all happens at an appointed time. But you have to stay in faith for the appointed time to happen for you. I've been wanting to be on TV since I was 10 years old. You know how old I was before I got on TV? 38. 38, 28 years after I wrote it on the paper. I won't be on TV. It took me 28 years to get on TV. But it happened at an appointed time. I just never gave up the faith. I kept going because I didn't know how to quit. Because I know if I quit, it cannot happen. If you stay with it, you have no idea what can happen for you. You can't quit because you get hard. This dude that lost his legs, he's still, he still funky with it. You can't quit because you got your leg. What you tripping for? You, you can't quit, man got to stay with it. It's somebody having it way harder than you and they didn't give up. You're tripping, man. Get yourself together. God got a great life for you. I'm telling you, God got a plan for you that's so out of sight, it would trip you out. All you got to do is ask him for it and wait on it and be willing to work. Faith without works is dead. That's all you got to do. You don't need no education. I flunked out of school. You know how many people I got working for me that got degrees? Everybody I hire got a degree. Because I know I ain't that smart. But I got money for you. Bruh, you got what I don't have. I'm a, you gonna take that 150 and help me get this billion. I got 154 billion. How God give me this and he won't give it to you? Look at me, I've been up here cussing, I made mistakes. But God don't ask you for your perfection. He asks you for your consistency. There's none perfect, no, not one. I'm going to give you the two scriptures that changed my entire life. Now, I had heard these scriptures growing up, but it didn't, it didn't sit with me until I was homeless. The first scripture, you have not because you ask not. Now listen to me. I cannot tell you how important that single scripture is. A lot of the problems I was having, and you may be having just like me, is because what I was asking God for was the wrong stuff. I kept going to him too small. I was praying for stuff that really didn't need that much of a prayer. You really think God don't know you need another job? He know all of that. But if you don't ask him for it, he can't. God don't give you what you want. He give you what you believe. See, you've been blowing it. If you up your ask, he ups his give. That's his promise. You have not because you ask not. Lord, help me fix my car so I can make it to work. Stop praying over these raggedy cars. Why don't you ask God for a car that don't need fixing? Oh, you think that's too big for him? Is that it? So you don't ask this great God for big stuff because you don't see how you can get it. You're not supposed to see how you can get it. You're just supposed to ask him for it. See, the how-to is none of your business. You keep getting in the way of the blessing because you all up in the how-to part of it. Show me the scripture where he tells you to figure out how to do anything. He don't ask you the how-to nothing. Write the vision and make it plain. Everything you want, you're supposed to write down. I'm telling you, man, this is how it works. You know, some rich people don't really have degrees. You just need the word. You need to know what it's saying applied to you. You know why? Because it's a promise of his. He ain't never lied. He always come through. If I was you, I'd try that. If you keep doing what you've been doing, you're going to keep getting what you've been getting. God for was to let me eat. Let me sit at the table with the big boys. Take me from this homelessness that I'm in and fill my coffers with, with 
with, with spoils. You know how much I have today? I have more than I ever thought I'd ever have. God didn't gave me more than I asked for because he got this thing he has called grace. The grace is, I wish, I wish I could buy it. You know, I wish I could buy grace, man. Justice is when you get what you deserve. Mercy is when you don't get what you deserve. He said, but grace is different from both of them. Grace is when you get what you don't deserve. Do you understand that? God has this thing that he passes out called grace. You ever heard old people say, all I want is a little more grace? Because guess what? He passes it out and he gives you things you don't deserve. I do not deserve this life I have. I'm just telling you flat out. The money I make, where I live, what I drive, how I travel, how I vacation, I don't deserve it. I work really hard, but I really don't deserve all this. I don't. I'm telling you flat out, I don't deserve it. But he gave me grace. He let me survive homelessness. He bought me from dark, man. I've, I've been out. Y'all don't know. I've been in it, man. I'm so grateful that God let me have this life he gave me that I don't even know what to do. What you see today is a boy that come out the bottom who believed in him when it wasn't no sign of me getting over, who kept doing this thing that his mother told him. She said, when it get dark for you and you can't find your way, and boy, I was lost. She said, don't forget to pray. Don't be ashamed to pray. And don't ever be too proud to pray because prayer, prayer changes things. You have got to pray. You know what you ought to get? You ought to, you ought to create your relationship with God. Because if you do that, he going to put some grace on you. And he going to give you some things you don't deserve. Then you won't need no education. You won't need to go and complete the program no more. You ain't got to go over here and ask nobody where they hide. God takes you to places that you never ever thought you could you go. I never saw myself here. But that God I serve, he saw me here. And he put me here. And all I'm doing right now is telling you that with God you can make it. I don't know why he had you come to this show. I don't know why I'm telling it to you like this today. But if you ain't ever tried God, listen to me. You should try him. Because he's very available to you right now. He don't love me no more than he love you. If God can pick me up. And you have no idea who you're really looking at. You don't know what I've done. If God can change me, he changed anybody in this room. God is good, man. First time ever in a comedy club, I won $50. I only went on a dare. I cried all the way from the comedy club to my house. The girl I was with named Gladys Jacobs said, why are you crying? It ain't but $50. I said, no, no, you don't understand. I was born tonight. Well, I've been asking God my whole life, what, what's my purpose? I need to find something that I do. I won $50 first time in a comedy club. I went to work the next day, October 9th, and quit my job with $50 in my pocket. Married, twins, $50. My ex-wife said, you can't do that. That's foolishness. Her mother told me. You're not even funny. My mother told me, boy, you don't do stuff like that. You work like your daddy and your brothers. I said, no, nah, mama, this is what I was born to do. And my mother was saved and, you know, Sunday school teacher, so I believed everything my mama told me. But this one time I said, mama, I got to go try this. I said, this is it for me. I said, if I don't do this, what I'm gonna do? She said, you gonna work like your daddy did. Your daddy work hard. I said, okay, well, I just work hard, but I'm going to go be something. 
The only person in my family that believed in me was my father. He said, boy, if you think you can make it, go ahead. Now, if you need some help, I'll give you a hundred there and now I And I've done nothing since that day except tell jokes. Now, I got in a lot of trouble. By the time I was 30, I was homeless. Because the first year in comedy, I only made 3500 The next year, I made $5,000. The third year in comedy, I made $6,800. You get homeless real fast like that. So I was trying to make my little money and send it to my wife and kids, but it wasn't enough. So I would just keep $25, enough to stay out there and get to the next gig. And uh, you know, it didn't, it didn't work for me for three years. I lived in my car. You have to take chances in life. You know, if you want your life to be something special, you eventually have to take a chance. You can't do normal things and expect extraordinary results. It doesn't work that way. You have to take an exceptional chance one time. And it's going to cost you something that you care deeply about. Bishop Jakes told me one time, he said, in order to get to the next level in life, you can see where you want to go, but it's a glass ceiling. The reason you can see it is because it's a glass ceiling. In order to break through a glass ceiling, you're going to have to shatter the glass. Anytime you shatter the glass, it's going to be bloodshed. And the blood that you shed is going to be something that you care deeply about. So if you are not willing to shed something you care deeply about, you cannot go to the next level. Most people let their family keep them from going to the next level. Some people, your friends, some people, it's your job, your position keeps you from going to the next level. But if you go to work every day and you ain't happy, if you don't wake up overjoyed to go to work, that ain't no life, man. You got the wrong job. And you know why you got the wrong job? Because you ain't living in your gift. You only find peace and happiness when you live in your gift, the thing God created you to be. If you don't ever do what God created you to be, man, you'll never be content. You'll be miserable. All the time, I was miserable. For 27 years, misery. I couldn't figure it out. Until I won that money. I won $50. Just 50 It changed my whole life. I made a lot more since that 50. But guess what? I still I still tell jokes. So all these is is jokes. I don't be nothing else. I'm going to be funny. That's the deal, ain't it? If you hire me, you're going to get these jokes. Because that's my gift. I'm what you want me to do. They hired me to speak at this uh, insurance company one time. All these big wigs sitting there. And, uh, so I started telling jokes. The audience was dying laughing. This guy came up to me and said, I hired you as a motivational speaker. I said, that's what I do. Well, what's the laughing for? I said, because it holds people's attention. I said, go ask everybody what they got out of my message today. It ain't going to be the jokes. It's going to be something I told you. But you know, you got people that they don't, they don't want to hear that. But that's my gift. And if you live in your gift, you'll find your completeness. Until you find, live in your gift, you cannot be complete. When God created you, he gave you all a gift. All of you in here are gifted. You are gifted people. What is your gift? Your gift is the thing that you do the absolute best with the least amount of effort. Once you identify that, your life changes. God takes you to new heights. You find peace. You find joy. You, f you wake up in the morning. You can't wait to go to work. If you're waking up in the morning and you hate going to work, it's because you ain't living in your gift. I don't even have an alarm. I wake up every day ready to go to work because guess what? I'm going to go tell these jokes. They're going to give me this check. I'm, look what I'm doing. I'm, 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 look, that, that is available to you, though. That God that created you has that same thing available to you. Every last one of you. I bet he do. I dare you to try it. I dare you. that I've met, man, that were like heroes to me. When I met Richard Pryor at the ABC Comedy Awards in 96, I was standing right in front of him at this table. And um, this lady said, Steve, do you know who you're standing in front of? I said, no. She said, turn around. I turned around and 
I bent over, I shook his hand, he said, I heard a lot about you. Lynn told me, you're pretty funny. And it's Richard Pryor, I couldn't even talk. I said, I love you, man. Thank you, because he was the whole reason I got into comedy, you know. I got through talking with him. The, the, the ABC Comedy Awards was in this huge hangar they had decorated. I went behind the bar, cried for 20 minutes. I couldn't even. Richard Pryor. Then this girl came back there and saw me and got me and said, Richard wants you to call him sometime. I went to my seat and started <laughs> start calling that number from my seat. I got Richard Pryor's phone number and I ended up forming a friendship with him before he died. I used to go by his house, play dominoes with him. That was the moment when I met Muhammad Ali. That crushed me. Cried again. I ain't when I meet people that really matter to me, you know. Met, 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 met Mike Tyson one time and just was scared. <laughs> Wasn't a hero of mine and then I was just scared of him. Well, same advice I give to my kids, man. If I could get them to understand the importance of their 20s. Because, man, you know what I did? I just blew my 20s. I ended up spending all of my 30s fixing what I messed up in my 30s. I spent all of my 40s doing what I could have been doing in my 30s. I looked up, man, I had let too much time slip away. If you could get young people to get their foot on the gas pedal in their 20s, because right now they think going out is everything. And I keep telling them, man, you're going to outgrow that in a minute. Because, you know, like at this age, it's when somebody says, hey, we're going to go out to a club tonight. <laughs> what? Go out to a club? Are you kidding me? It don't make no sense to you now because you're over that. But it takes a minute for them to understand that, man. It's sad. I wish they'd get it. But it was, I wasn't clubbing in my 20s. I just, I didn't, I didn't know how to make a vision board. I didn't, I didn't know how to. What really changed my life, man, was I started, I got in Amway when I was about 24. I got in Amway. And that changed my life, man, because the first time ever, they introduced me to self-help books. And I read two books that changed my life. It was uh, The Power of Positive Thinking by Norman Vincent Peale and The Magic of Thinking Big by David Schwartz. I read them books and it changed my life. But it also made me remember what my mother had taught me because she was a Sunday school teacher because all self-help books are Bible-based. There's nothing... Everything comes from the Bible. All of all them self-help books, that's Proverbs. That's all it is. It's the book of wisdom and understanding. If you, if you could read that, it, it'd change your life too. But sometimes you need you know, regular books where you can relate to it differently. But it all comes from the Bible. It's like a great book is the secret. But if you read the secret, it's all Bible first. I mean, it's just based on the Bible. You can't think of nothing new how to tell a person to succeed without the Bible. You can't. It's, it's, it doesn't work that way, you know, so a couple of books changed my life, man. But the magic of thinking big was huge for me. It just taught me one simple principle. It don't cost no more energy to think big than it does small. You can say Volkswagen and you can say Rolls Royce with the same amount of effort. You ain't got the grunt to say Rolls Royce. So if the Bible is true, which it says a man is as he thinking, if you think poor thoughts, you got to be poor. The moment you change that thought into wealth or riches, you start the process to becoming wealthy or rich. It's, 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 it's not a magic trick. It's, I mean, it's really how it works. I, you know, people complicate it. You got to do this and you got to do that. But the Bible's pretty plain. It ain't got no loopholes in it. it. really don't. It's just real simple. It say what it say. All you got to do is believe it's talking to you. <laughs> That's what it is. Most people don't think that God is talking to them, that I come to give you life and give you life more abundantly. You don't think he's talking to you? He'll give you life more abundantly. He do. He really will. You ain't got to be rich to have an abundant life. Sometimes you just need to be healthy, happy. You know, you could be really happy, man, making $70,000 a year. You really, really can. You don't need a few million. I did, but you can you didn't need a few. 
it helped me a little bit. But to be honest, it didn't make me happy. It really didn't. And to you, well, I need God to be happy. So I ain't, gonna, I ain't no preacher. So we got ministers in the room. So I'm just telling y'all from a hood perspective what I did to get here. You can go to church and hear it. Take it from a dude to come out the bottom. Ain't got it. Ain't gonna pass the offer trail. I don't really care. If you don't believe me, you ain't got to. But I made it. Don't ever give up. I don't care how dark it seemed for you. Don't ever give up. Don't ever stop believing. And I know sometimes that's difficult because it seems like, man, it ain't going right at all. I was reading a book T.D. Jakes has out. It's called Hope for Every Moment. It's like one of those, you've seen those daily thought books. It's inspirational thoughts for every day of the year is what it is. My daughters actually gave it to me for my birthday because they've seen me change as a person over the years. I'm not guessing this. They've actually written it to me. And so they really do appreciate the change of me just becoming a better person, you know, because when you become a better person, you become a better person not only for yourself, but a lot of people are affected by you being a better person. Your children are affected. Your wife is affected. Your coworkers are affected. A lot of your friends are affected. Your neighbors get affected. When you become a better person, start to make that change, it affects a lot of people. The biggest benefit of it all will probably be you. I know I've benefited the most. There are so many auxiliary benefits of just being a better person. And, and I, I've stopped saying trying to be a better person because I just got to go about the business of getting better. Now, doesn't mean that I'm mistake free. That's not what that is. And it doesn't mean I don't still need encouragement and I won't fall and make a lot more mistakes because I will. But I find, man, in these books that they give me, I find so many inspirational things. And this morning when I decided to say to everybody, don't ever give up because I know how difficult it can be. Because I do understand, man, that we will all face moments and challenges in our life that's going to require us to just hold on. I wanted to encourage everybody. In this book I read, it says, uh, well, it didn't say it, but I'm, I'm paraphrasing it now. If you ever felt like you can't find him nowhere, I mean, you ever been in a hole so dark and a situation so bad, you just felt like, man, I just, I just can't find him nowhere. Or I can't find him where I thought he would be. I've actually felt that before. And I was thinking, man, well, okay, Steve, well, maybe a lot of people have been feeling that way. Maybe you ought to share your experience with them. And that's what I'm doing today, you know. Maybe you've told yourself that the storm going to be over soon. See, this is the one that I used to do. I used to say, man, the storm going to be over soon. And then the sun came out, and then it just left. Okay, hold on. Then the sun came out, and then it just left. And then the rains just keep coming. I, sometimes, man, you just go, wow. And it almost feels like God then missed his appointment. Okay. See, this is why I used to really get in trouble. I used to think, man, okay, is he not listening to me? Does he not hear me? Because I'm, I'm not only calling, I'm actually crying. I'm crying out. And, and I want this to be fixed now. You know, I used to think, okay, man, I've been praying about this. I've been going through this. Okay, I done said I give. I done already said I get the message. I have done said I get the point. Man, I was wrong. Do I have to keep getting beat like this? Ain't I paid enough for my wrong decision? I used to just think like that. I think he'd have moved on it by now. But what I want y'all to remember is that, and this is what I read in this book. In the book it said that God doesn't synchronize his clock by your little mortal watch. God don't synchronize his clock by your little watch you got on your wrist. God is in control of this whole thing. He does not move in a timely basis according to what you got to have. Now, he going to fix it for you. He going to get it together for you. But it's in his time because he doing a whole lot of shaping and moving. And what I had to learn about when I was praying for stuff was... It ain't just me that's affected. Remember at the top where I said when you become a better person, it affects everybody? Well, guess what? When God answers a prayer, it affects everybody. See, everybody got to learn lessons along the way. 
and maybe he got you going through a little bit more than what it looks like they going through because he never puts more on you than you can bear. And so he puts you in a situation that you can handle. So what you got to do is, since God don't synchronize his clock by your little mortal watch, he got a set time that he going to bless you. The key for you is to hold on. That's the key for you, is to hold on. Okay, let me, let me tell you this. I was going to tell you this. The way to become a millionaire, if you could think of how to become a millionaire, you do it by Friday. You don't have to go that far. All you have to do is think of your God-given gift. All of you have the ability to make, you can charge, all of you can do something somebody will pay you $10 to do. I don't care if it's cutting grass, doing their hair, painting a wall, babysitting, uh, taking care of the elderly, teaching, tutoring. Everybody can do something for $10. This is how I got to this place of success. My jokes were $25 a night. I made that for a long time. Whatever you do to make $10, this gift that God has given you at birth, because God never created a soul he didn't give a gift to. All of you have one. All of you have one. I don't care if it's frying chicken. Some of you fry chicken better than anybody else, bake pie, do hair something. Do whatever it is for $10. After you make the $10, I want you to do it 10 more times. You'll now have $100. After you make $100, whatever you did to make the $100, that $10 idea, I want you to do it 10 more times. You're gonna have $1,000. Now, it's gonna get a little more difficult, but after you make $1,000, whatever you did to make the $1,000, I want you to do it 10 more times. You now have $10,000. Now, now we gotta focus now. Whatever you did to make $10,000, that started off with your $10 idea. What I want you to do is focus. I want you to do it 10 more times. You now have $100,000. Now, this is where it gets very, very difficult. You're gonna have to hire some people. You're gonna have to pay some people some money. But you take that $100,000 and you reinvest it. And what I want you to do is whatever you did to make the $10 that you did 100 times that turned into $100,000, all I want you to do is take that same idea. Don't change nothing. Do it 10 more times. I got news for you. You have just made a million dollars. And all it was was a $10 idea. You do not have to complicate this thing. You don't need an education to do this. You just need the principles of success. I'm telling you, man, I took these $25 jokes and I turned them into a lifestyle. You can take this God-given gift that he gave you and stop thinking of how to make a million. Just go make $10 and do everything 10 times as hard. Now, it's going to be hard. Understand that. It's going to be very hard. But you ain't got nothing else to do. Because let me tell you something about being not successful. Being not successful, that's really hard to me. So you might as well apply yourself to something that has a benefit. I'm telling you, that's how you make a million dollars. Quit tripping. Quit tripping. You have the way God has already given it to you to make $10. All you got to do is do it in multiple. That's all anybody do. That's all. It's just 10 people got on Facebook. Then 10 more people. Then 10 more people. Then 10 million got on now, now they, they, they got 100 million people on Facebook. Now, this dude making billions of dollars. It's the same thing. It's, it's what it is. You have it in you. You just got to apply. And you got to believe that it can happen for you. All right. You ain't got to believe me. I'm just trying to tell you. I'm telling you. you should do every time you get a chance to experience first class you should do it because it plants a seed it's like the next time you buy an airplane ticket just ask for an upgrade pay a little extra money fly first class what it does is it conditions your mind once you get in first class and you see how wide the seats are 
and you find you, you find out why they shut that curtain, see, because they shut that curtain because they can't let you see what's going on up there. They passing out hot nuts. Everybody get a washcloth. They got a menu. You get to decide what you want. All the drinks is free. Once you sit in first class one time, the next time you get on the plane, it's very difficult to walk past them seats. And then your mind starts thinking of ways to get back to first class. And guess what? That's what you start attracting to your life. And you start behaving and producing stuff to get you back into first class. That's how you move up. You just have, like, like buy you one really expensive outfit. Just see how it fits. That fit is high for a reason. Don't think they down there just putting prices on. Buy a really expensive pair of shoes, lady. Buy a really expensive purse one time. It's gone down there. Buy the real Louis Vuitton that ain't ever on sale. Louis Vuitton don't even have sales. Just get you one. When you carry it, it changes your life. It will then cause your mind to subconsciously produce thoughts to get another one. And next thing you know, you attract the thing you need to produce the outcome that you want. Life is all about the law of attraction. That's how you do it. Just, just try it. The beginning of being anything is the dream. The beginning of being anything, it starts with a dream. One day, somebody had the dream of being able to fly like a bird. Well, today we have airplanes. Somebody had a dream of one day going into outer space. People go to the moon and they come back. People one day had dreams of being able to travel at high speeds, all types of things. It, it all starts with a dream. Martin Luther King had a dream that one day all of us could unite and come together. Well, it's happening. It hasn't fully happened, but it's happening. But it started with a dream. Those dreams are available to each and every one of us. So parents, if you have a child that says something that's beyond the realm of your thinking, don't make it not possible. So when your child says, I'm going to be a star, and you don't really see the talent, they got something in them that you might not know about. They may have a dream and something burning inside of them that you don't know anything about. It all starts with a dream. The Bible says that a man without a dream or a vision shall perish. And that's so true. If you don't have nothing you're working for, nothing you're shooting for, you really have no focal point in life and you wander around aimlessly all the time. So all of you out there, whatever your dream is and dream big, my father used to tell me all the time, he says, son, aim for the moon because if you miss, you'll still be amongst the stars. The bigger you dream, the wider you let your mind fly, the more capable you become of accomplishing the thing. See, you've got to understand that it doesn't matter your financial circumstance it doesn't matter what environment you live in. If you can see yourself out of the project, if you can see yourself outside the ghetto wall, if you can, if you can see yourself anywhere, then guess what? See it. See it and believe it to be so. That is the beginning of all things happening. It is your dream and your vision. And let me give you some advice. Don't share all your dreams with everybody. Because the moment you say something to somebody and they don't see it for you or themselves, they start telling you how it won't happen. Now you allow that into in into your mindset when all you was doing was wanting it to be so. And now guess what? Then comes the stumbling blocks, the hurdles, the pits in the road. And now you find yourself trying to understand what they were saying when all you really had to do was go on with your dream. So when I have dreams or ambitions, I only tell one person. I usually tell my wife. And after that, I don't really share it with a whole lot of people because I know that everybody ain't pulling for me, but I know she is. So I share with her what I'm thinking about becoming and doing and hoping for us and our family. And that's who I tell it to. I don't tell it to my friends, my boys. I don't tell it to my manager. I don't tell it to nobody because guess what? They got their own agendas too. Now they don't see it for you because then that's going to get in the way of some plan they had for us and them. And now next thing you know, they working against that because they got another plan. So I don't really share it with people. I share it with my folk and I share it with my God. And that's it. But do dream. If you can't think of what to dream, stop at a magazine stand or a bookstore and flip through magazines and see stuff that you'd like to have. See places that you'd like to go. Imagine things that you'd like to be. 
Sit down and close your eyes and imagine where you would like to be because that is the beginning. It is the dream. There's a whole series of things you got to do to become successful, but just today, I'm just going to stay on this one thing. Do not be afraid to dream. Do not be afraid to think that you can. And remember this, you ain't too old to have a dream. Anybody can dream. I don't care if you're 45, 55, 65. You can dream about something. It can still happen for you. And the younger you start dreaming, the better you get at dreaming. And when you get good at dreaming, then after a while, you're going to have to start making some of this stuff come true. And next thing you know, you're on your way. But it starts with a dream. So dream big. Open up magazines. Cut them cartoons and them sitcoms off and quit watching soap operas all day. And do something that'll stimulate your mind. The Travel Channel. The Discovery Channel. Watch a cooking show. Just get into some other things, man. You never know what's inside you. And something may spark a flame that burns in you that you really didn't even know you had. But you got to open up your mind and let it fly. Dream on with your bad self. And don't let nobody tell you that you can't. And the best way to not have a person tell you you can't is to not tell them what you want in the first place. It's your dream. It really ain't got nothing to do with nobody else. And in my story, maybe you can see some of yourself. Listen, man, anybody can be successful, but you got to understand something. It's hard. It's hard, man. You can take all the courses you want. It's hard. You can go down there to the church and hold your hands in a prayer circle. When you get through praying, it's going to be hard. You go to school, you can get all the degrees you want. When you get them degrees and you hang them on the wall, if you want to be successful, it's going to be hard. It's hard being successful. That's the first thing you need to understand. I was telling you that I lived in a car for three years. In my 30s, I was homeless. I was homeless based off of a decision I made. October 8th, 1985, I walked in a comedy club for the very first time. Never been in a comedy club, but I had been writing jokes for a dude taking my jokes going to a comedy club. He was paying me $10 for it. I had never been to a comedy club, had never heard of a comedy club. I was writing for a buddy of mine named A.J. Jamal. He would pay me 10 bucks a joke. One day, I was writing some jokes for him, and I was over his house to drop him off, and this girl named Gladys Jacobs came over to the house. And she said, you the dude that's writing the jokes for A.J. Jamal? I said, yeah. She said, he the funniest dude at the comedy club. I said, at the what? She said, he's the funniest dude at the comedy club. I'm 27. I've never heard of a comedy club. Now, all my life, I wanted to be on TV. I'm going to tell you that story a little bit later. But I just said, man at the comedy club, she said, you should come. She said, why don't you tell the jokes yourself? Now I'm thinking, I said, man, this could be what I've been asking God my whole life. See, some of you in this spot where you keep asking God, what do I do next? What's my next move? You know the hardest thing about your life? Trying to figure it out. Ain't that hard? <laughs> but do you know that you ain't supposed to do that? Do you know that God already designed you for a purpose in life and if you would just simply ask God what it was he could guide you to it and the search for what I'm supposed to do would be over but oh no we so busy figuring it out I got news for you how to do something the how to is none of your business that's what I never knew so I was just wanting man to just be on TV since I was a little kid and this girl said come to the comedy club so I go to the comedy club with her she said we're going to go Tuesday night. I want you to sign up to perform next week. And then I want you to see how I go first. I said, cool. So I went, I walked in the comedy club. I signed up for the following week. And I sit down, supposed to be 10 dudes perform. Nine of them went up. Now, I ain't laughed all night. She said, you're not laughing at none of these jokes. You know why? Because what they were doing was my actual gift. It was the thing I've been doing my whole life. So 
I wasn't laughing at their jokes because I knew everything they was going to say and I knew everything they should have said where the joke would have really been funny. So I'm just sitting there just a student, man. So it got to the 10th guy and they called his name and nobody went up. And they called his name again. They said, well, looks like number 10 isn't here. We're going to go to next week's list. Steve Harvey, come on out. I looked at that girl, Gladys. I said, it's crazy. I said, it's somebody in here got the same name I got. She said, you really can't be this stupid. She said, boy, that's you. I run up on stage, I ain't got nothing. First thing I say to the audience is, hey, I appreciate y'all clapping, but I ain't supposed to be here. I'm on next week's show. So the girl Gladys yelled out, tell them about when you was boxing. So on the way down, I had told her this story about boxing. So I did the boxing joke. Mike Tyson loves to fight. Yes. He don't care if it's in the ring or out the ring. Man or woman. Mike just wants to get it on. And if you don't think that's true, you just ask that heavyweight fighter Mitch Green. These, these people was in the flow laughing. So then, I didn't have nothing else, so I had wrote some jokes for my buddy A.J. Jamal that I hadn't sold to him yet. So I said, well, hell, let me try these. So I did them jokes. They died laughing. They bought me off stage. They brought all 10 of us up on stage. They had a clap off. That night, I won the clap off. I won amateur night, October 8th, 1985. They paid me $50. I get in the car. I'm 40 minutes from my house. Gladys is driving me home. I'm crying the entire time. I can't stop crying. She said, what you crying for? It's just $50. I said, no, you don't understand. This ain't $50. I've been born to this ain't $50. This God answering a prayer of mine that I've been praying for 20 years. This ain't $50. This is what I'm going to do the rest of my life. I went to work the next day, October 8th, 1985, and quit my job. I have done nothing since October 8th, 1985 except one thing. I've been telling these here jokes. That's all I've ever done. That gift that God gave me. You know, the Bible says your gift will make room for you. It'll make room for you. See, if you're not doing your gift, you're wasting your time. Your gift will make room for you. you got to identify your God-given gift. If you don't identify your gift, you're going to waste your time. Telling jokes is my gift. So even as a motivational speaker, I use my gift. Nothing's more boring than sitting up listening to somebody talk for 45 minutes and you ain't laughed in 45 minutes. Listen, if I want to, I could turn this into a comedy show. I promise everybody in here be throwing up. If I want to. 1968, came off school off of a summer vacation. I'm 10 years old. The assignment the teacher had was everybody in the school class write your name on a piece of paper and what you want to be when you grow up. I wrote on my paper, I want to be on TV. That's what I wrote. That lady said, turn in your papers. She asked, she went around the room, called everybody's name up. You had to stand while she read your paper. She read off everybody's name. She saved me for last. She said, little Stevie, come to the front. I'm thinking, okay, this is it. I ain't never had a gold star in school in my life. I've never been recognized for academic achievements in my life. I've never got an award of any kind in my life. Here I come. Little Stevie coming to the front. I got a belt that's too big, it's tied around me twice. They used to call me tater chip in school because I was shaped like a potato chip. And I walked up there 
and I'm standing in front of class. Now, I told you a minute ago I had a severe stuttering problem in school. I could not talk outside of my house. I stuttered severely. I thought this woman was going to give me a gold star because I figured nobody else in the class had wrote, I want to be on TV but me. So mine must be the best answer of all of them. So I'm standing up there, and that lady started in on me. She didn't call me up there to give me no gold star. She called me to the front to humiliate me. And that lady did me. She said, why did you put something like this on your paper? Now, you've called me to the front. You know I have a stuttering problem. You know I can't talk. So she started, why did you write this on your paper? Who in your family ever been on TV? Who in this school ever been on TV? Who in this neighborhood has ever been on television? She said, why would you write something like that on your paper? And look at you standing there, you can't even talk. I was crushed. Why would you write that on your paper? You can't even talk. This is a teacher. You're supposed to be shaping and molding my mind. We pay you to educate me. Why would you write something like that on your paper? You will never be on TV. Every Christmas, I send her a flat screen TV. Because I don't want her to miss me. I wanted her to see what God had done for me. The fact that they don't see the dream, the fact that they don't see what you can be has nothing to do with what God can do. Nothing at all. I don't care who you are, go cut your TV on. You cut your TV on seven days a week. That little black boy with the stuttering problem, he all over that TV. That little black boy messed around and became a TV star. She didn't see it. How many times have you shared a dream with somebody and they didn't see it? I heard somebody talk about the importance of education and education is critical. You have to be educated. You have to be well read. You got to be well versed. There's no way around it. I'm going to make a statement. I don't know how it's going to fly in this room. But here I go. Education is not the most important thing in your life. It's not. I spoke at a school one time and I said that principal of the school came up and had me removed from the stage. I was just trying to help his students. Education is not the most important thing. Do you know how many people I know with education that ain't working? Do you know how many people I know with degrees ain't got no job? Do you know how many people I know with multiple degrees ain't making no money? The single most important thing in your life is your dream. It's your dream. It's what you dream about. It's in your Bible. It says a man without a dream or vision shall perish. It don't mention education in the Bible. The University of Jamaica is not in the Bible. Without dreams and visions, you can't make it. If you got no dream, if you got no vision, you're sunk, you're done. I'm sorry. I'm just giving you the basics of how to be successful. This is how I got here. I'm going to give you something that changed my life. A very short scripture changed my life. You have not because you ask not. It's in James 4 and 2. Uh Uh-oh, listen to me. I can't even tell you how big that is. Look at me. This is the coldest thing I'm going to tell you today. You have not Because you ask not. It's that simple. 
Most people don't have the life of their dreams because you ain't never asked God could you have it. You've been trying to do it yourself. You've been trying to figure it out for yourself, how that's been working out for you. Kind of crazy, ain't it? I just told you earlier, you can't figure it out. Ain't no scripture nowhere tell you to figure it out. What you trying to figure your life out for? It ain't yours. You ain't making. You ain't the creator. You ain't got nothing to do with tomorrow. You can't change the past. So what you tripping with your life for? You have not cause you ask not. Y'all ain't never asked God could you be rich. Most people ain't rich today cause you ain't never asked God could you be rich. I ask God every day when I was homeless. My God is faithful and my God is powerful and my God is in charge. At the lowest point of my life, I ask God every day could I be rich. You know why? Because I had had it up to here with being poor. I lived in the car, dog. I ain't had no backyard. I ain't had no TV, I ain't had no phone, I ain't got no bathroom, I ain't got no sink. I asked God every day, could I be rich? I told God, if you let me make it, when I get there, I'm gonna, every chance I get, I'm gonna tell everybody it was you. Here I am, and it was him. It was him. Now you got another route you wanna take, go ahead. See, the thing about having faith is, you don't need nobody's permission. You don't have to take out a loan. You don't have to get accepted into the course. You can start your faith today. You can start your walk with God today. You ain't got to clear it with nobody. There's plenty of openings. He's available. All you got to do is go. I got rich, and I'm not bragging, but I'm just telling you, I got rich because I asked. It is an amazing scripture, man. If you would only ask, well, Steve, what do I ask for? Everything. You want a relationship with God where God is not only your king, he's your companion, he's your guide, he's your friend. You know how you can tell your friend anything? That's the relationship he's looking for. You ain't got to go to church to get that. You had that at your house. You can have a relationship with God on your own. You, you got to have that, man. You got to start asking God for big stuff. Stop wasting God's time with all this little stuff. Lord, help me make my rent. Don't he always? Has it ever occurred to you that maybe you should ask God for a mortgage? You ever thought of that? You don't think God got mortgage money? But you know why you don't ask God for the mortgage? Because you keep getting in the way. It says you have not because you ask not. But you say, well, I don't have a job that uh, dictates I would afford a mortgage. I don't make enough money. I got bad credit. You think God don't know that? He said ask. You have not because you ask not. So you woo yourself out of the mortgage simply because you won't ask. Just go ahead and ask God for the house. You think God don't know you need a better job? You block your own blessing because you get in the way of the answer. Just ask God for big stuff. Lord Jesus, help me get out of debt in seven years. Why would you ask God to get you out of debt in seven years? Who you think you're talking to? Ain't this the same God that made heaven and earth in six days? Why would it take him seven years to get you out of debt? He made heaven and earth in six days. You need seven years from God to get you out of debt. <laughs> You're crazy. God do big stuff. Ask God for something big. Now, here's the second. The next thing you need to do, Oprah been on TV for 30 years telling people about vision boards. If you don't have a vision board, if you don't have your dreams written down, that's the other reason you don't have it. I just gave you the two main reasons why people don't have the life of their dreams. Number one, you don't ask God for it. And number two, you won't write it down. It has to be written. You have to write it down. It's a principle of success. 
anybody can be successful. You just have to know the principles of success. See, I know the principles of success. I could stop and go start selling tomatoes. And I could go make a lot of money selling tomatoes. You know why? Because I know the principles of success. The second principle you need to know is you have to write it down. But that's the scripture. That's Habakkuk 2 and 2. Write the vision and make it plain so that he who reads it will run to it. And even though it tarry, wait for it. For surely it will come at an appointed time. I don't know but four five, but I know four five good ones don't. Everything I've ever dreamed and asked God for, I done wrote it down. Everything I ever had had come from a piece of paper. And everything extra I got come from his grace. I got stuff. He gave me stuff more than on the paper. But see, you ain't got no time for that, though. So here's the exercise I want all of you to do. I'm just telling you how to be successful. This is how I did it. I ain't, ain't going to take no course. I don't have no plan. I flunked out of school. I have no education. Albert Einstein has a quote that changed my life. I'm going to give it to you. Because this is for everybody in this room. Because it's something that we all have and you may have never understood. Albert Einstein said, imagination is everything. It's the preview to life's coming attractions. I want you to listen to me now because this is this, going to be my last thing. But this is so good, man. If you can get this right here, this can change it for you. Imagination is everything. It's the preview to life's coming attraction. You know what that means? That means everything you see in this world came from somebody's imagination. Everything. The Wright brothers said, man, I want to fly like a bird. They laughed them out the gym. See, you've been thinking all this time that your imagination was just some hocus pocus. It ain't. It ain't. I'm finna teach you something now. I want you to hear me on this one. Cause this is the most powerful thing that I can tell you today. Albert Einstein had that quote, but Albert Einstein took that quote out the Bible. Albert Einstein took the second half of my mother's favorite scripture. My mother's favorite scripture is, and you've all heard it, faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. Oh, I'm in front of the right crowd now. I usually tell that to people, they be going, what, where's that? Faith is the substance of things hoped for. What better message than faith and hope? While you sitting in this room trying to get to the next level, listen to me. There will be no more levels for you unless you get to the next level of your faith. There ain't no more levels for you, partner. You where you at. Your imagination is a preview of a coming attraction God has for you. That's what your imagination is. That's what it's been this whole time. All them times you've been imagining being rich, that wasn't just up there. God put it in your head because that's what he got for you. That big house you keep wanting, God put it in your head because that's what God got for you. That promotion on the job you keep imagining, that's what God put in your head because that's what he got for you. When you keep dreaming of taking a summer vacation somewhere, that's because that's what God got for you. When you dream of retiring one day, having retirement income, it's in your imagination because God put it there because that's a coming attraction that God has for you. That's what your imagination is. You've been tripping. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. Now check this out. The second half of that scripture. And the evidence of things not seen. Here go the lesson. Your imagination is the evidence of things not seen. 
You know why it's the evidence of things not seen? Because your imagination, you're the only one can see it. Nobody can see your imagination but you. But God places what he has for you in your imagination. After you become an adult, it shouldn't be hope no more. This ought to start turning into some faith. You got to go, man, I done hoped hard enough and God gave it to me. What's the matter with calling it faith? Quit hoping, man. Turn it into faith. Faith is the belief in things that you cannot see. You got to ask God for something. Remember I told you, write it down. Ask for something from God. You don't know how in the world you're going to get it. You know what's on my vision board? Things I have no idea how I'm going to get. That's what ought to be on your vision board. You know how many times you done wrote your imagination off? You know the danger about your imagination? You tell it to the wrong people. That's the danger. You want to kill a big dream? Tell it to a small-minded person. Boy, they'll shoot it down every time, won't they? You know how many wonderful ideas you've had. Stuff that God gave to you, you thought was, man, this is it. You went in there to your friends and your family and you shared it with them and they shot it down. You know why they shot it down? Because they ain't see it. You know why they ain't see it? Because God ain't give it to them. Because he put it in your imagination. If he'd have wanted them to imagine it, he'd have put it in their head. That's why people can't see what you're going to be. That's why they teach you. That teacher mind, look at you, you're standing there. You can't even talk. How they going to put somebody like you on TV? Well, lady, what you didn't know was I wasn't going to stutter forever. You didn't know God was going to get me over to stuttering, did you? You didn't see it. Because nobody else from 112th Street ever been on TV. You ain't think I'd be the first. You know why? Because you ain't see it. But God didn't put me being on TV in her head. He put it in me. He put it in my head. I was just dumb enough to think it could happen. When you gonna get dumb enough to think that your imagination is real? If I was you, I'd hurry up and get that stupid. I really would. I know this is a motivational conference. I know you want to hear about some book you can go buy and read. You already got the book. It's at your house. It's the one with the dust on it. Do you know everything you need to know about success is in there? Every self-help book today is written off the principles that's in the Bible. Now, is it good to buy these other books? Yes, it is. But if you got a Bible, it's in there. But if you want a Bible book that's based on the Bible, go buy this book called The Magic of Thinking Big. Faith without works is dead. You have not because you ask not. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. Write the vision and make it plain. I gave you four right there that changed your life. Somebody say, well, if you're going to mention God, you need to stop all these jokes. This is what I do. I tell jokes. I tell jokes for a living. How much money I done made telling jokes? I told a dude when he hired me. I use humor because I hold people's attention with humor. I'm telling you, somebody going to find something wrong with it. Somebody always finds something wrong with what you're doing, even if it's okay. Somebody always. Man, don't you know I'm used to that? I don't appreciate him talking about the Lord that much. Well, okay, well, don't have me back. I didn't like the jokes. We're here for motivation. I didn't like the jokes. Go on social media right now. They dogging me about something. But you know what? It don't matter what they say, because what they say don't matter. Who is these people talking about me? Don't none of them people that's talking about me ever met me. They thumb gangsters. Hey, listen, I've told you a lot of things. I hope you grasp some of it. I want you to know that I was really honored to be here. I pray. I ask God what to go tell the people. I come out here without the paper. And I tell you what God told me to tell you. I hope I've encouraged you. I hope I've reminded you of some things. I hope I've shared some light. I hope that you all live the life of your dreams because it's possible. 
God is in the make your dream come true business. I told you what he did for me. What he did for me, he will surely do for you. Hey, I love y'all. Thank y'all very much. I've discovered that your career is what you paid for. Your calling is what you made for. Sharing my story, if it helps another person get to where they want to be in life, wherever that is, I think that's, that's, that's a pretty good deal. I mean, I've evolved over the years. I've never been afraid to reinvent myself.